So we now have time for um, these uh, various, many and various questions that have appeared in the chat bar. So I will uh, endeavor to respond to these as best I can. Um, I'm not very good at short answers, so I will uh, try to discipline myself. So the first one, just, uh, get my glasses. Spiritual seekers often come across personal development gurus whose teachings are based on the belief of the law of attraction, which claims that thoughts can change a person's life directly with no mention of morality. Some of these teachers sell materials through what seem to be Ponzi schemes and or multi-level marketing. Yet these teachers seem very persuasive, quote, awakening the giant within, unquote. Were there such teachers in uh, Buddha times? And then uh, could the Eightfold Path be used to help analyze the worthiness of such teachers and their teachings? Um, <laughs> I don't know about uh, Ponzi schemes as we know them today, but I'm pretty sure there was extremely similar things going on in the Buddha's time. Um, people who were uh, certainly in the... Um, in the different spiritual teachers that the Buddha encountered and had dialogues with or that are talked about. There were ones who are more uh, interested in fame and influence, uh, having a following than uh, say interested in the truth. And uh, say, for, for example, what comes to mind is the teacher Sanjaya, who was the teacher of Venerable Sariputta and Venerable Moggallana uh, before they joined the Buddha. And there's this very poignant exchange between them, so that uh, uh, Venerable Sariputta had met um, the Bhikkhu Asaji, Venerable Asaji, and had been very impressed by him, inspired by him. And um, so then Venerable Asaji said, well, if you're impressed with me, you should meet my teacher. So then Venerable Sariputta went along to meet the Buddha and was very impressed. He went back and told his friend Mahamogalana and said, you know, I've met this great spiritual master. Um, and so then they had both become quite inspired and impressed by the Buddha. So then they went to their teacher. They were already wanderers under the guidance of this teacher called Sanjaya. And they said to Sanjaya, well, we've met this incredible master, um, the, the Samana Gotama. And um, yeah, he's really amazingly wise. And uh, I think it will be of uh, great benefit. You know, you're a spiritual teacher yourself and you've got great influence. But, you know, this, this uh, monk is something really amazing. So out of our love and respect for you, please come along with us and, and meet the Buddha. That's a paraphrase, uh, uh, not an accurate uh, re, uh, retelling of the story. Anyhow, anyhow um, Sanjaya makes this very poignant um, sort of comment, sort of sad, tragic uh, comment. He says, there are wise people in the world and there are foolish people in the world. Um, uh, you know, you've met you've met the the uh, the Samana Gotama, the Buddha Bhagawan. So, um, if you want to go with him, please go with him. Um, uh, but uh, you know, I've I've got this reputation, I have this following, and so um, I'll just stay where I am. I, I won't come with you to 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 meet this Buddha and become his follower. There are wise people in the world, um, and uh, you know, and there are foolish people in the world. I'll take the foolish ones. The words to that effect. And so he quite consciously said, well, I, I've got this role, I have this position, I have these followers, uh, maybe we're deluded, um, and uh, we probably are, but uh, I, I can't let go of my role as a teacher and as a leader, so I'll just take the foolish ones to be my followers, and please, you, know, you can go off and do as you choose. Um, so it's a tragic uh, uh, that he would think that way, but I think it's also a credit that he would speak in that fashion, if that's an accurate, uh, say, retelling of the story. And that that's been sort of passed on in, in the scriptural teachings, that uh, he chose delusion rather than, uh, and his status, rather than putting that all aside and becoming the Buddha's follower. Whereas another teacher like uh, Kasapa, uh, Kasapa uh, of Gaya, who had a large following of 500 uh, fire worshipping um, ascetics were his followers. And he was very, very respected, very well known, very much loved. And he was happy to 
to publicly bow at the Buddha's feet and say, you know, the, the Samana Gautama is my teacher, I am the student, he is the teacher, I am the student, <laughs> and publicly declare his discipleship of the Buddha and so gen and consciously and publicly step down from that role. So in terms of, of um, the uh, way to, to um, uh, analyze the worthiness of such teachers and teachings, yeah, I think they're using the, um, the wisdom faculties of right view and of uh, uh, the um, uh, right intention, Sama, uh, Sama Ditti, Sama Sankapo, uh, those are you know, the wisdom factors of the Eightfold Path. Also really using um, wise reflection, investigation, Yoniso Manasikara and uh, Dhamma Vijaya, investigation of reality. That's the, the way to, to, uh, to examine, to explore. Um, particularly, I think it's re relevant is what the, the Buddha says in the Kalama Sutta, which probably many people are very familiar with, where the people of Kesaputta, a village called Kesaputta in uh, northern India, uh, the Buddha came through and they said, well, uh, we're, uh, we have a lot of different wanderers and seekers and yogis and, and uh, summoners who come through and each one says what I teach is true and what uh, other people say is wrong. How do we know who's right? How do we know who to follow? Um, how do we know who, who's, whose advice is reliable? And the Buddha said, well, uh, uh, Kalamas, you doubt that which should be doubted. So he said, yeah, good, you're, you're in doubt, good. <laughs> you doubt that which should be doubted. So it's very good that you, uh, that you are, are questioning in this way. And then he laid out this set of 10 criteria. He said, um, when, uh, when somebody comes through and they offer teachings, then don't believe them just because they're a famous teacher, just because their teaching makes logical sense, or just because it's, it's supported by inductive or deductive reasoning. Uh, don't believe them just because your family or your parents um, tell you it's true, or just because it's written down in the scriptures and they, they're quoting scripture at you. Don't believe people just because it's, um, say, the, um, the, the common belief that this person is reliable, but rather listen to what they say, test it out, and see for yourself what the, uh, what the effect is. If you see that following their advice leads to benefit, leads to harmony between yourself and others, leads to liberation, then take it and use it. If it leads to division between yourself and others, it leads to confusion, it leads to discord, uh, then lay it aside. And so with respect to um, the uh, personal development gurus, yeah, uh, look at the effects of what, what they teach. Um, also look at the people that are around, you know, how, <laughs> how impressive are the results of, of people putting that, uh, uh, that process into practice? What's, what's the effect on, on others? What's the effect on you? And then with a, with a, a weather eye, as they say, to weigh up and, and to assess um, what looks beneficial, and then use your own experience as the, uh, the measure. Um, so the next one, could, uh, could you explain what is the relationship between the five spiritual faculties and the eightfold path? Um, well, they map onto each other quite a lot. Um, so say um, um, the uh, Iviria, uh, energy in the five faculties is close to uh, right, effort, vayama, in the Eightfold Path. Uh, wisdom, uh, the wisdom factors of right view, right intention, that maps on, uh, of the Eightfold Path maps on to the, the wisdom factor of the, uh, of the five faculties. Um, samadhi, concentration, is there in both the five faculties and the Eightfold Path. Mindfulness, sati, is there in both the five faculties, the eightfold path. So they they map onto each other fairly, um, uh, so fairly completely. Uh, the the Buddha spoke in different ways with different groups of people. You know, it wasn't like here is the one model that matches all people, all um, all mindsets, all languages in, in all situations. But he used a, a huge variety of different formats, and so. Um, like when he was talking to a, a farmer, to a cowherd, he used the format of, you know, the 11 ways to look after your cows to keep them healthy. And then he, he tabulated a list of 11 spiritual qualities and ways of, of looking after your mind. 
uh, uh, so you know he's talking to a cowherd so he talked in that way and he's talking to a, a soldier and then he talks about the parts of a chariot and how a chariot is put together and what's in, what makes a chariot you know run effectively so uh, these different formats are not meant to be exclusive or um, in totally 100% consistent um, but they I would say that they map onto each other fairly fairly closely I think the the um, the factors of the eightfold path are I say laying out um, you know qualities that uh, that can be developed and similarly the five faculties also are uh, spiritual qualities mental qualities that can be developed uh, in the eightfold path you have things like um, action right action and right livelihood so that's a little bit more expansive into the social sphere um, and you don't have that so uh, re you know referred to in the in such detail in the the five spiritual faculties so in the eightfold path that the sila element the virtue element right speech right action right livelihood that um, is spelled out in more detail and i would say perhaps in the, the five spiritual faculties then that's a combination of mindfulness and uh, and wisdom and faith those sort of come together to in inform what our, our appropriate and skillful ways of speaking and acting are but uh, yeah, sometimes lists match and sometimes they don't uh, so don't look for entire sort of watertight logical consistency between all of the buddha's lists it's like what's the right recipe for making a cake depends which cookbook you read <laughs> which which recipe you read in the cookbook you know there's a, a lot of ways to make a cake so the buddha is explaining that the different lists are sort of the ingredients for various different cakes okay next one could you elaborate on the terms kusala akusala wholesome skillful and unwholesome unskillful what are their pali connotations meanings how do you use them to support practice as a categorical teaching how do how do they relate to other teachings such as emptiness non-identification or the practice of mindfulness uh, well i said a fair amount uh, earlier about this so kusala and akusala it's um they're they're not absolute moral judgments uh, to say that you know if if you do this then you know you will be rewarded this is this is a hundred percent good or this is this is evil and uh if you do this it's a hundred percent bad but rather it's pointing to cause and effect and if this uh if this is a wholesome intention if this is a, a wholesome action like a, an act of generosity uh, an act of compassion a, an act of unselfishness then it's likely to have a pleasant result for 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 the other person for for yourself it's likely to have a, a result that brings brightness that brings ease that brings uh, freedom and, and benefit similarly that which is akusala is likely to have a painful result if you're telling a lie or if you're stealing something if you're deceiving um, your partner if you're um the uh, making uh say uh, um making use of uh, of things that are, are not yours that uh, are i say are stolen from others then uh the result is likely to be painful if you tell a lie you've got to then sustain the lie you've got to remember what the lie was so you, <laughs> you can keep the lie going that's hard work uh and then when somebody finds out that you have lied to them then there's the division and bitterness between you so that uh, as painful results generally come from lying or stealing or taking advantage advantage of, of others or or being deceptive in your relationships and and so forth so that uh it's that you don't have a in in buddhism you don't have a concept of an absolute good or an absolute evil in the in the same way that you do in some other religious forms but rather it's looking at how cause and effect work and so that uh, uh, that is in terms of of uh, uh, say the other teachings relating to emptiness and non-identification or the practice of mindfulness it's it's seeing um, uh, with like emptiness and non-identification it's it's uh, very relevant really because it's showing this is how nature works 
if uh, if this action is taken and it involves the the um, the stealing of property or the deception of another being or taking of life um, uh, in a completely non-personal way that's going to have a, a a painful result you'll be wanted by the law <laughs> or even uh, or the the animal that you're killing will uh, will have pain and distress in the act of being killed or being being hurt being damaged um, the person who's been robbed will have feelings of, of, of resentment and pain and, and uh, uh, negative uh, reactions arising within them and so that um, the uh, you can say well all, all dhammas are not self the action of stealing is not self and the other person's resentment is not self but also the the the, the policeman who's coming to your door is is also uh, that's the role of a police uh, a police officer coming to your door knocking on your door and you know that that personality is as empty as yours is but the conventions of society are you know this theft happened um your name is uh, you know this, your name is on it here's the police officer coming to investigate and you will uh, as a consequence experience the perceptions of being locked up in jail or, or going through a court case and you'll deal with the perceptions of being in prison with a lot of of uh people who are not very um sympathetic or friendly or uh, e eager to make your life more comfortable so they're just perceptions they're your life in the prison is also empty but th there will be the consequence of life in prison and living with the other inmates uh, and dealing with that that comes as a consequence of your uh, of those actions they're all empty of self but the laws of cause and effect and the natural order still function and uh, that's a, an area that people often misunderstand. They think, uh, well, you know, all th everything is empty, you know, all dhammas are not self, therefore I can do whatever I like, and quote unquote, there are no consequences. Well, there, there, there are, you know. <laughs> the force of gravity still works. People's feelings still work. And, and as, uh, as Ajahn Chah put it very, very simply, he said, yeah, what makes it wrong? It's wrong because of people. <laughs> and that the uh, we we live with social conventions uh, on, a, on a different score uh, maybe the person who, who uh, I had this conversation with is on this uh, this weekend but uh, uh, on, on a 10-day retreat here a couple of years ago one of the retreatants had a, a, a had some profound experiences of insight and um, and so there was these uh, so say the understanding of anatta and seeing her life in a very different way seeing her personality and her family and the world in a very different way and she was saying well how do i how do i take this back home or how do i relate to this outside of the retreat environment you know when 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 my granddaughter comes to say hello and when i get home you know what what do i say to my granddaughter when she comes up to to greet me and says you know hello granny you know do i tell her that that i don't exist or she doesn't really exist either I said, no, don't do that. You'll, you'll freak her out. You know, <laughs> the, 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 telling your five-year-old, a five-year-old granddaughter, no, no, you don't exist, and I don't either. That's probably not going to have a very good result uh, for a five-year-old. And so that uh, you you can um, play the part and go along with the 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 substance of social conventions, but. There's a, a knowing that this is uh, this isn't absolutely and completely who and what we are, but in the purpose of of dealing with the rest of the traffic on the road or, or talking with your your grandchildren, um, then we follow along with the ordinary everyday language of society. And the Buddha made the same point. He, when somebody asked him, you know, you, know, you say all dhammas are not self, you know, all things are not self. Yet you use personal pronouns like you know she, he, we, they, you, I. You know, what's this with the pronouns if there if if everything is not self and you can almost hear the buddha sighing like or rolling his eyes <laughs> like, yeah i use the conventions of common speech uh for the purpose of communication that uh, these terms are used without any kind of delusion or without any kind of uh, of a uh, ascription of the idea of a permanent and uh, totally independent self so uh, that's um uh, hopefully that clarifies things a little bit. Next one. How can we handle identities and conventions that are placed upon us by the world? These identities and conventions can determine our opportunities, involve expectations, and depending on how we perform, we might be punished or rewarded. 
by our families, peers, institutions, society. Um, so yeah, I think similarly, <laughs> the, uh, if you recognize it's a, it's a, uh, a persona, it's a mask. I mean, I, I, I'm abbot of Amravati Monastery. Um, that's what it says on the on the label. You know? <laughs> so uh, that's that is relevant to the people who live here with me. Uh, it's not. It doesn't matter very much to the goldfish in the in my pond, or to the magpies that, that come and visit the garden. Uh, it doesn't matter very much to the 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 people that I might meet on the street in Berkhamsted or walking down the Euston Road in in London. It's like. There's a, a guy in a brown sheet with a shaved head. They don't know my name or my role. It's not relevant um, to, to my sisters. I'm their little brother. They know technically I'm the abbot of the monastery, but essentially we're talking together or we're spending time together because I'm their brother. <laughs> That's why we're in the same room. So uh, if we wear our roles lightly and see that they apply in certain circumstances and don't apply in other circumstances, it's like if you're going to the dentist, and yeah, uh, and you're you're a um, you're a consultant heart surgeon, and then you you sit in the dentist chair, then you know the if you expect the dentist to treat you as a, a sort of high-ranking consultant, you know don't you know who I am? <laughs> like, you, you're a, you, you're holding your role in a in a foolish way. As far as the dentist is concerned, that that the dentist is only interested in your teeth. I would say, maybe, maybe I'm presuming too much, but uh, that's what you're in the chair for. And you're, you're there because your teeth need looking at and need treating. That's the circumstance of how you're engaging with others. So when you're sitting in the dentist chair, you're just a patient of the dentist. You're not the doctor. You're not the one in charge. You're the, you're the follower. Like, uh, like uh, now uh, Ajahn Sumedho has come to live back here at Amravati. So uh, up until earlier in this year, I would sit in the main seat in the middle of the, of the temple because I was the, the abbot, the most senior monk in the community. Now that uh, Lumpur Sumedho is back here, then that seat is left for him. And I, I sit off to one side because yeah, I'm the abbot, but he's the most senior person. He's the teacher. He's the, the elder. So I get out of the way for him and very glad to do so. <laughs> so. So if we wear our roles lightly and we don't take them to be absolute realities, then life is, is very um, uh, so comfortable and, and easy. So if you think that your roles are absolute, uh, absolute truths, or even if people around you, can, you know, are determined to see you as the teacher or the, the consultant surgeon, or <laughs> they keep putting you in that role, you don't, even if people project that onto you, you don't have to pick it up. It's like, that's something they're creating you don't have to receive it in the same terms that they're putting it out there. And that was something I, I saw with uh, Ajahn Chah, I, even though I couldn't speak Thai, just seeing his body language and the way he handled groups of people when they came to visit, it's like you could see that people would project all kinds of things onto him as the great teacher, or the one who's this, or the authority who tells everyone what to do, or, or they'd be incredibly flattering, or sort of dewy-eyed devotion. And, he didn't, there was a this, this sense that he didn't need to be seen in any particular way. If people praised him or loved him or expressed admiration and devotion, he didn't push it away, but he didn't sort of grasp it and hang onto it or feed on it. It was like, okay, that's, that's coming from them. That's how they see me. That's their business. I don't have to get drunk on it. I don't have to reject it. I don't have to have an opinion about it. Um, and so not being closed, but also not needing to get anything from anyone, not, not so needing to be seen in a particular way. And then when he came to, to England the first time, and pe people on the street in London would relate to him just as a, a weird guy on a brown sheet, then uh, he was quite happy with that. He was sort of, he'd uh, turn around to, to one of the other monks and say, that was interesting, wasn't it? <laughs> just being treated like a, as a sort of, a weirdo on the street in Hampstead, you know, like the, who's uh, been seen as a as a you know a religious twit, you know, a fool or an idiot. Um, yeah, Ajahn Chah was quite amused by that. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's different. Rather than don't you know who I am? You know, I'm the great Ajahn. You know, I'm a I'm a spiritual person. You know, if I'm on a plane, when I used to travel on planes, 
<laughs> haven't done that in the last couple of years. You know, I'm just a bloke in seat, you know, J17 or, you know, or F35. To the, to the the cabin crew, that that's who I am. I'm not anybody special. I'm not the abbot of the monastery. I'm just that bloke in J13 or F35. That's all. Why should I be anything more than that? And if we're able to pick up roles and perform them and then put them down, then life is a lot more fluid and, and, and easy. Other people can have all kinds of expectations of you. You don't have to go along with their expectations. And uh, I've spent a lot of energy in my life <laughs> feeling I had to live up to other people's expectations um, and feeling burdened by that. Yeah, but uh, the, uh, the and that uh, I used to have a, a, a I copied out a, a Charlie Brown um, uh, Peanuts cartoon uh, and uh, there was I think it was Schroeder the one who's the piano player and he looks out of the, 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 the little cartoon box and says, there's no, no heavier burden than other people's expectations. And I kind of <laughs> copied that out and pinned it up on my wall when I was a, in the, a, a, a school student. So we can pick those up and be burdened by them, but we don't have to. And again, the spiritual practice can be something that genuinely helps us to know, well, that's that person's wishes. May they be happy with that. <laughs> Yeah, they're handing that out and it's like fine you know they're, they're saying here take this and you say you know nice nice glove you got there may you be happy with it <laughs> that's uh, and you might think well that sounds a bit glib or you don't know my family Ajahn like oh you know if only it was that easy but internally we can relate to those those demands or expectations in that way not with aversion, not with, with, with grasping or fear or anxiety, but rather, okay, this is what my parents expect of me, or this is what my boss expects of me, this is what my, my students expect of me. Okay, that, that's their business. I, I, I'll do what I can do and let the world make of it what it will. Some people will praise it, some people will criticize it, and a lot of people won't even notice. So there's a lot more we could do a, a whole day long on dealing with projections and expectations <laughs> but uh yeah i found over over time that uh really just to say that again to have that confidence to just do what you do uh, again trust it like i was talking about compassion trusting that you care you're doing what you can and that uh, you do what you do and let the world make of it what it will and when I first started to look at that, that was like an unthinkable thought. It's like, no, 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 no. People have got to approve me. I've got to get it right. I can't get it wrong. What will, what will, what will they think if I don't do well? And I was really uptight about trying to please everyone and succeed all the time. But then as I saw that and, and started to, to relax around it and just um, took a, a more open and spacious attitude, one of the monks here at Amravati said, you know, you're a, lot e you're a lot easier to live with since you stopped trying to be perfect. <laughs> I was kind of simultaneously offended and delighted when he said that. Uh, but I, I really took it to heart. I thought, well, that's an interesting comment. And then where, uh, after working with that for a couple of years, I, I, I came to that conclusion. I would say that, use that as a kind of mantra. Just do what you do and let the world make of it what it will. And again, at first that was unthinkable. It's like, ah! <laughs> but slowly working with that, then it became the reality. So that's what I do. Like with these, this day, day longs uh, yesterday and today, I'm just doing what I do. Some of you will love it. Some of you will hate it. And a, a, a lot will just sort of slide off and you get on with your, your, the next thing that needs to be taken care of. I'm not judging you or insulting you, hopefully, <laughs> but just that's how we are as human beings. You know, that I can't control what you will make of this weekend. Uh, that's up to you. <laughs> uh, I can just do my best and then let you make of it what you will. And so there's, a, and I trust that I care. I trust that I am doing my best. I'm putting my heart into it, but exactly what the result will be for all of you, I can't say. There might be one thing that I've said that has completely transformed your world and made life totally different from here on. And there might be something that is so so offensive, so upsetting, so awful, it's turned you off Buddhism or Anajan Amaro forever. <laughs> I don't know. I hope not. But um, 
Uh, and then probably most people are somewhere in between. But uh, just trusting to do what you do, let the world make of it what it will. People have their expectations, they change. Even though somebody might, might be very loud and demonstrative <laughs> in what, how they expect you to be, notice how you know, a week later or a year later, their attitude might have changed altogether. They, that thing that was such a big issue, they might have forgotten about, or they've changed their perception altogether. So we, we learn to be adaptable in those uh, respects. Okay, next one. Ajahn, you have said mind has no place and is outside time, yet here and now and presence are taught. Clarification, please. <laughs> so, uh, yes, well, the, a word like here is a convenient fiction because, it, it, again, our language and our imagery is all in form. It, it borrows its structures from the perceptions of the three-dimensional world and the passing of time. That, that's, what, that's where language comes from. And so it's like, again, if, uh, listening to uh, Lumpur Sumedho's Dhamma talks recently, over and over again, he'll say, you know, the unconditioned, or Dhamma, is unimaginable. You can't create an image for it. So what is, what is timelessness? What, is, what does timelessness look like? The unconditioned, unborn, unconditioned, uncreated, unformed. What does that look like? Even though using a word like looking, <laughs> like what? Well, uh, using a word like space. Space relates to uh, to three dimensional uh, reality. So, in terms of dhamma, even space, infinite space or no space, that doesn't really apply. So, when we use words like presence, here and now. Uh, they are convenient fictions. So we can talk about there's awareness or there is knowing, um, uh, and that quality is, is present. That's the, the, uh, the, in a sense, the, 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 the one real quality <laughs> is knowing. That the, 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 is the, the, the very fabric of all of our experience is that quality of knowing. Um, but then what is known the world of time and things, uh, uh, presence, <laughs> paying attention. These are all um, conventional forms or con convenient fictions, approximations. They're like a, a best guess or a, um, it's like, it's like saying, you know, uh, a, 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 an inch is exactly one twelfth of a foot or a centimeter is exactly one hundredth, uh, one hundredth of a meter. How long is a meter? Well, a, a meter is the uh, uh, um, uh, exactly the length of a rod that's kept in <laughs> in a special chamber in Paris. Or, or, and a kilogram is exactly the the, the weight of a um, of a hundred milli uh, one liter of water at uh, at such and such a temperature. That's what a liter is. You know, the, any measure, like this is exactly one liter, this is exactly a foot, this is exactly an inch or a centimeter, they're necessarily approximations. So, okay, uh, a second is exactly you know, 10 to the, uh, the you know, 10 point, you know, five, seven, eight, six, five, four, three, two, one um, uh, cycles a tenth of, the, uh, of the cesium atom at, uh, at you know, a zero degrees centigrade. That is what one second is. That that's the vibration of a cesium atom. The cesium clock runs on that. But then, uh, at, a, at a, another level, it's like okay, if you look in the subatomic world at a cesium atom, even those measures are, are enormous approximations. So hopefully, I'm not losing people too much. <laughs> but any way of naming things has to be an approximation. So it's saying today is Sunday. In New Zealand, it's not. It's Monday already. We invented the seven day week. Tomorrow is the full moon day. So this is the last day of the first month of the rainy season. That's, you know, you can say this is the 15th day uh, of the, the second fortnight of the, the rainy season. Uh, this is uh, the, um, the 
tomorrow will be the full moon. That will be the last day of the second fortnight of the rainy season. What day is it? <laughs> we call it a Sunday. We call it uh, August the 22nd. These are conventions. They're agreements. So when we recollect that any word, any concept uh, can only be a, uh, an approximation, it can't tell the whole story. You know, in a way, it's like where the Buddha said, Sabe Sankara Dukkha, all conditioned things are unsatisfactory. Yeah, no conditioned thing can fully satisfy. You can't get a perfect thing. Things are always in a state of change. So when we realize, well, it's just an approximation, or what's the real text of the Tripitaka? What did the Buddha really say? <laughs> well, what we have in the Pali Canon is a, a set of approximations. He didn't speak English. I've been quoting you know, like the Sutta about the bonfire. The Buddha didn't say anything about bonfire. He used agi, which is the, you know, or maybe the Magadhi word that in Pali is agi. <laughs> and then we say bonfire. You know, it's an approximation. It serves a purpose. If we, if we recognize that, then we can use the, the languaging, the everyday speech, without delusion. We know that words, concepts, they can only point in the direction of, of reality, of Dhamma, but the Dhamma itself is unimaginable. Uh, so we don't try to create an image or a perfect expression to, to describe it, because we know it's essentially undescribable. Un, unnameable really um, and but yet it can be realized it can be known and that's why the quality of awareness itself that that's what can know ultimate reality it can know the dhamma it can know that that ultimate truth and that the, the any words that are used to point at that are necessarily going to fall short and the, the buddha realized this right from the time of his enlightenment and so he uh, approached his spiritual teachings through the pathway of the Four Noble Truths, say like Dukkha and the ending of Dukkha, rather than let me tell you what ultimate reality is like in some kind of poetic or fantastic metaphysical description. He said, he realized, no, you can't do it. It's not going to work. So rather than trying to describe ultimate reality, uh, he just used words like timeless, you know, apparent here and now, uh, encouraging investigations of words that talk about so what pointing to that that quality but uh most of the attention was on uh say where the mind is getting attached and where to let go of those attachments so rather than describing kind of what we are quote unquote <laughs> then the buddha's approach was rather than trying to define and describe the undescribable sort of what we are ultimately and completely instead uh, take and put the attention on letting go of what we're not, what we habitually take to be what we are as a woman, as a man, as old and young, as uh, tall and short, as uh, this and that. Let go of, of what we're not, and then what remains is what's real. <laughs> you don't have to define it or, or name it or conceptualize around it. You don't have to give it a, a label or, an, or a number or a, a form. It's uh, unborn, un unconditioned, uncreated, unformed. And even using those words, <laughs> they, they can only point in that direction. Okay, so please, you mentioned a society that does not have a term for number or color. That was a piraha in uh, the book that I read about them. It's called Don't Sleep, There Are Snakes. I recommend it quite regularly. Don't Sleep, There Are Snakes. Uh, it's written by an American uh, actually, he was a, a linguistics expert, and that was why he was sent to look after, to try and convert that tribe, because the, the previous missionaries had all failed, and they thought it was because they couldn't speak the language. But he had to learn to experience the world like the Piraha in order to be able to speak their language. So they have hundreds of thousands of verb forms to describe experience and what's happening, but it's a, it's a whole different way of formulating the experience of, of the world that to without color, without number, uh, and self and time and all those familiar structures are just not formed in the same way. In the Buddhist time, were there any written systems for culture or commerce? Yes. If so, what language were these in? 
And so did Buddha actively choose not to have any of his many teachings written down? Um, he didn't forbid them to be written down. Um, he, there were many languages that were spoken. And uh, so the, in Magadha, they spoke Magadhi. Uh, in, in Kosala, they would speak Kosalan. In, in uh, uh, Anga, they would speak Angan. In the uh, Vajian Confederacy, they'd speak Vajian. And so there was variations in, in, in um, you know, language and um, expression. And so the... Uh, uh, often in the, in the Buddha's teaching, he'll make a whole string of different words, like uh, chakung, uh, vision arose, knowledge arose, understanding arose, wisdom arose, light arose. So chakung udupadi, nyanam udupadi, panya udupadi, vijja udupadi, aloka udupadi. And one of the, the, um, the ways of understanding, why would the Buddha use all those you know, five or six different words to describe the arising of wisdom or understanding? Uh, one of the theories is that, well, in Magadha, they, they, say, uh, they say vision, and in Anga, they say wisdom, and in Uttarakuru, they say light. They all mean the same thing, but they're using different words to refer to the same quality. So that it, within the Buddha's teaching and in the Pali recitations, you get these very regularly, you get these long strings of, of words that are just sort of, of, of overlapping meanings. Um, and uh, it's a, there's a suggestion that because he was talking to groups of people from many different layers of society, from, from uh, subsistence farmers to merchants to, uh, to um, you know, the, uh, say, wealthy families to rulers and uh, military people and uh, so on and so forth. So there's a big range of people he was talking to. So um, he didn't forbid the teachings to be written down, but... Uh, very few people would have actually been able to read. So actually in the Vinaya scriptures, um, the ability to write is noted as a, a particular skill that a few people had when they came into the Sangha, or it's sort of notable, or oh, this person has the ability, like you'd say someone is a lawyer, or someone was a, was a doctor, or they were a, they were a teacher before. So it, it was a skill, but it was like being a lawyer, you know, it's a very particular skill. You would have had a certain training, but 99% of the people wouldn't be able to read or, or write. Um, what you have on the inscriptions in Emperor Ashoka's time is a script called Brahmi. So that the, the um, inscriptions on the Ashokan monuments of pillars and rocks are in the Brahmi script. Um, and also on the, the uh, funerary urns where the relics were kept, it's similarly... The, the relics of the of the the Buddha or the great enlightened beings, the the, the words on the written on those funerary urns are in Brahmi script. So that by the time of Emperor Ashoka, a couple of hundred years after the Buddha, then that was the common written language that um, that was used for for people to uh, understand with. So whether the Buddha was illiterate or not, I don't know. Uh, it's not clear whether he ever wrote anything. He was a soldier rather than a business person or a priest. So um, he would have probably learned uh, all his religious teachings through listening uh, and uh, in, through the oral tradition. Um, and let's see, was the Buddha illiterate? And so Buddhism is primarily an oral tradition, hence perhaps why this weekend has been so powerful. I'm not, I don't know about that, but um, uh, it was primarily an oral tradition because, as I said, 99% of the people who were coming into the Sangha or who were listening to teachings um, would have not been able to read. And so the story goes that the scriptures were not uh, sort of uh, written down and widely circulated in written form until about 73 before the, the year 73 before the Common Era in Sri Lanka. Uh, in the northern uh, in northern India, it was written down in Sanskrit and Prakrit uh, much earlier, but the Pali was written down uh, in 73 uh, before the Common Era, when there was a, a, a war in Sri Lanka that had been invaded from southern India, and there was a famine. And so the king, um, uh, some of the Sri Lankan people gathered, can tell me whether it was Dutagamani or Vatagamani, or one of those ancient Sri Lankan kings, um, said, okay, 
uh, we have to write this down. And he commanded that the whole Tripitaka be put into written form and preserved. Um, and that happened in a place called Dambula, the Aloka Bihara, the, the caves of light. Um, well, during that, that wartime, and, and the, the, the whole of the Pali Canon was written down on uh, Ola uh, palm leaves uh, at that time. Okay, maybe one more. It's all 4.30 already. Uh, let's see. Yesterday during the Q&A, you mentioned that there are teachings related to non-possessive love. Could you please explain a bit more about, about it? Well, the easiest thing to say is to look at the book, um, The Breakthrough, <laughs> the Shameless Self-Promotion. There's a whole chapter uh, in the, a book of mine called The Breakthrough that you can find online on the Amravati website. A chapter called, um, uh, I just happen to have a copy here, quite by chance. And Possessive Love and Liberative Love, Chapter 9. Uh, so in this book, The Breakthrough, you can find that on the Amravati website. So uh, take a look at Chapter 9, Possessive Love and Liberative Love. And that should tell you everything that could tell you live at the moment. And let's see, question for Ajahn. You mentioned lineage and becoming a follower, quote unquote. Can attendees of this weekend say that you are our teacher? Or what do I have to do to be able to say you are my teacher? Um, well, going back to people's projections, and <laughs> I can't stop you saying that I'm your teacher. That's your business. But if someone says to me, will you be my teacher? Uh, I say, well, you can you can look at me that way, but I'm not going to um, put myself in that role for for you. I don't say uh, take people on and say, okay, you are my student. If people want to be listening to what I say or showing up to my events or reading my books, fine, Sartu, you know, please make use of of the things that I say. Uh, fine, that, that's great. But uh, uh, I uh, I don't uh, like I don't. Um, uh, say, go along with that that format of a person accepting other people as a sort of formal student, and so and that's far more the the way it works in the majority of the of the um, the the uh, say the in the forest tradition people might consider themselves a, as a, a follower of this teacher or that teacher, um, but it's it's never formalized um, or or I wouldn't say never, but it's usually not formalized or structured in any way, but that person could just keep showing up or signing up for every event they can and fine it's hard to you know uh, but uh it's uh, it, uh it's not something that is sort of uh inked in or or, or uh, say uh, formalized in any particular way 